Hi, Dan Chan here. The Altura Photo 0.43 times wide angle lens mounts to the front of your camera's existing fixed or zoom lens and allows you to capture a wider field of view. As an added bonus, the bottom portion unscrews and converts into a macro lens for close-up photography of small objects. The cost is $40, and for that amount, it wasn't too big of a risk to pick one up to see what it could do. The lens comes in four different thread mount sizes, and I bought the 55mm to attach to the front of my Sony AX53 camcorder. And when it arrived, I was pleasantly surprised that it's a solid and weighty little lens with an all-metal lens barrel and multi-coated lens elements. Fit and finish is high quality, and it comes with a soft carry bag. My camcorder's internal lens is 26mm at its widest, and the attachment lens performed as advertised in widening the view, but not excessively so. It's the macro portion that I'm finding the most useful. High quality macro lenses can cost hundreds if not thousands, and I have no illusions that this attachment will be their equal. But if this little bonus lens was even modestly acceptable, it would be worth the 40 bucks. Now I have limited experience with close-up photography, Back in the film days, I owned a set of inexpensive macro close-up filters that shortened the close focusing distance of my kit lens. And I played around with them a little bit, but never took close-up photography too far. Besides a good macro lens, there are more close-up photography equipment to invest in. Focusing rails, extension tubes, and ring lights, etc. Shooting macro stills did get my feet wet enough to know that the extremely shallow depth of field in macro focusing wasn't easy. So now I want to do some macro videos. Video requires subject motion and movement and this motion all has to take place within a tiny square inch. Live insects would be the logical subjects. When insects are highly magnified we as viewers are taken down to bug level where we get a unique look at their habits. I could tell right away that keeping these fast moving little bugs within that one inch frame was going to be a challenge. And since I don't live in the rainforest where all the cool insects hang out, I found my ready but not so willing subjects under boards and rocks in my own backyard. I remember as a kid, I froze a fly a little bit and super glued its legs to a tiny paper airplane. When he thawed, off he flew, fly powering the little plane into the sky. So if it worked back then, it would work again. And I gave the beetle and earwigs five minutes in the freezer to get them into diapause, a state of suspended animation. I set up a makeshift macro studio with lots of light. I'll be stopping down my lens all the way to maximize depth of field. And the bright sunlight from the window will both light and warm the bugs. I made a pencil mark to get a basic idea where to find my focal point. Next, I dropped in a 3D proxy for the bug. A small screw would make an adequate stand-in. And now it was time to place Chilly Willy in the frame and let the warmth of the sun revive him. I took care not to damage him in his frozen state, but still needed to work quickly so as not to miss my window of opportunity before his revival. With a few last-minute adjustments, it was almost showtime. In macro photography, Focusing is accomplished by moving the camera in and out from the subject. I wanted the beetle on his feet, but his legs were just too stiff. Finally, he's all ready for his performance. But Willie had a mind of his own and just wouldn't cooperate. If I flipped him over now, he would just crawl out of frame. So I'll just have to take what I get. I guess I'll just have to settle for some fancy breakdance moves. Ultimately, now fully rejuvenated, he crawled away. I had better luck with the earwigs. They came back to life slowly and stayed in frame, grooming their antennae. Since I had four of them, I staggered their freezing, 
so that when one fully recovered and crawled out of frame, I could substitute a stunt double in his place. The antennae, yes, antennae is correct for more than one, are actually the insect's nose and are used for sense of smell. Leaving antennae dirty essentially blinds the insect to their environment, so grooming is to enhance olfactory acuity. Earwigs were named from the ear-like shape of their tiny underwings. It is myth that they purposely crawl into the ears of sleeping persons for the purpose of burrowing into their brain to lay eggs. Earwigs are nocturnal and feed on decaying organic matter, other insects, and plants. Most people are repulsed by earwigs and will go out of their way to step on pincher bugs. Although non-poisonous and not very destructive to plants, pest exterminators are frequently called out for their removal. The pincher on their hind end is used to fight off predators who would make a meal of them. The hind forceps are also used in the mating ritual between males battling for dominance and to hold female earwigs in position. The female earwig lays her eggs and then spends all her time with them to prevent mold from killing them. She eats the mold off her eggs to keep them clean. Fully recovered, Penny the pincher bug exits the frame. Yes, I said Penny. This is a female. Male pinchers are more curved inward. Isn't the internet a wonderful thing? My actors performed well and deserve their freedom. And no bugs were harmed in the making of this video. And just remember, every earwig has a mom out there somewhere who ate mold off them when they were little eggs.